Welcome to the Explore the Bible Sunday School lesson for August the 11th, 2024. Today's lesson is taken from the last part of the ninth chapter of the book of Acts and is entitled Healing. In our last lesson, we looked at the uh, experiences that Saul had in Damascus. We saw his conversion. We saw his Damascus Road experience that uh, was the lead in to his conversion. Uh, we saw how Ananias approached him and told him of the things he needed to know, particularly that he was going to be a minister uh, to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. Since that time, uh, Paul began to preach and teach in the synagogues, talking about what he had experienced, I'm sure, given his testimony, uh, showing how the scriptures fit in as Ananias had taught him. He actually created such a disturbance that uh, the Jews, the Jewish leaders there, plotted to kill him. Uh, word of this uh, leaked out, and they were able to help Paul escape by putting him in, in a basket and lowering him over the city wall. Uh, since that time, Paul uh, went back to the community of Jerusalem and uh, began to meet with the uh, people there, and they did not receive him very well. You remember, the last time Paul came to prayer meeting, it was not a happy occasion. And so they were hesitant uh, to be sure that this was not a trick, uh, that uh, Paul was sincerely converted in this. The one individual that really took pity on him, though, and helped to bring him into the church fold was a man by the name of Barnabas. Barnabas, the encourager. Barnabas is looking after him. He encourages Paul to go back. They, actually, he goes to Tarsus uh, to recruit back to his hometown. Now, having gotten Paul to this point in his uh, ministry, in his, uh, in his Christian walk, Luke goes back to talk to us for a little bit about Peter. There's a few more things in the life of Peter that need to be brought out, uh, talked to, to the church body here. And in this particular passage, we're going to see how Peter was ministering uh, to the people that needed help and how he reached out to those of all groups in reaching out to do this help. In fact, uh, next week, or the next lesson, the 10th chapter, uh, we'll be talking about Cornelius and how God led him to see uh, what was going on there. Our key phrase for this lesson, uh, as you know, in, if you have the uh, People's uh, Study Guide, uh, you'll know that at the beginning of each lesson, it, it lays out the title and the references, the key verses, and there's always a key phrase. And the key phrase for this particular study is, God invites his followers to be instruments of his power. That was true for Peter. It's going to be true for us today, too. This is what we're talking about, Peter being an instrument God uses. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the opportunity you give us to be instruments for you. And I pray, Father, that you would help us be faithful to be those instruments. Help us to be faithful to carry out what you call on us to do. Thank you, Father, for your watch care over us. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Peter's been traveling about. You remember that he was in Samaria when we last saw him. Peter and John had been sent by the church in Jerusalem to see what was going on with Philip and his ministry there. And he has uh, done that work there. And since then, he's been traveling about, moving around to the different places to, to see what he can do and to help. This may be in, motivated in part by the great persecution that broke out in Jerusalem. Uh, following the stoning of Stephen, a great persecution bro broke out, causing a lot of the believers to be scattered. Uh, it was this great persecution, perhaps some of it led by Paul, who uh, was then sent to Damascus uh, on his uh, mission trip there. We do not know this for a fact, but Peter seems willing to go and to visit the other places and uh, already is engaged in that kind of activity uh, in his ministry here at this. Uh, today he's been traveling about and he has reached a place called Lydda or Lydda. As uh, we look at this, we're going to see that 
a man is called on to make his own bed. In the ninth chapter, the 32nd verse, we read, As Peter was traveling from place to place, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. So all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So here's Peter. He's reached the community of Lydda. Uh, this is a community to the west of uh, Samaria. If you'd be heading from the city of Samaria, or the province of Samaria toward the Mediterranean, uh, you would come to Lydda. It was a uh, Gentile city, uh, a city of importance. Uh, it was uh, particularly important to uh, the traders, the merchants who were traveling from Egypt on up into Syria. Uh, as they would come up the coastal highway, the, the way of the Philistines, uh, it would be where they would begin to cut across uh, to go over and cross the Jordan River Valley and head on north from there. So it was a, it was a really a, a trading city, a merchant city, uh, a city that was probably somewhat cosmopolitan, because of the different groups that would be going through there, the different ethnicities of merchants. And if such, it would be a place that would be uh, normal for the Jews to settle in and therefore for the Christians to be found there as the Jewish converts became Christians. And so it had a, an established church there already uh, when Peter arrives there. Uh, and this is a good spot. We had a time when we and the Southern Baptist life would have key cities, key cities that we really look to provide a witness in across the United States because we knew those cities would allow to branch out uh, with uh, mission churches from the churches that were established within them. Lida would be a great place to have some strong Christians from which they could branch out into the area. He's, Peter has seen that the church in Samaria is in good hands. Uh, he's ready to move on. His reputation as an apostle of Jesus uh, would have preceded him. Uh, people passing through would have carried word of him and what he was doing. Uh, and so when he arrives in Lydda, he's welcomed by the believers that are there. Uh, they want to see him. They want to be around him. They want to hear what he has to say. He's, he's really welcomed. While he's there, he comes upon a man by the name of Aeneas. Now, Aeneas uh, is likely already a believer. Uh, the scriptures do not have any uh, word about his uh, conversion or of uh, Peter speaking to him about a need for Christ, witnessing to him. Uh, he just is, is seen there as one having a need. And so we pretty much assume that he is a believer uh, who has a medical issue. This issue has caused him to be paralyzed, and therefore for the last eight years, he's been bedridden. Uh, this is a reminder to us that just because you accept Christ as your Savior does not mean all your problems go away. Whether they're medical or financial or even relational problems, those things still exist. Um, it's not a health and wealth uh, con uh, type of conversion. It's a eternal life conversion. It is a change spiritually within, not necessarily the physical aspects of life that is around you. This man has been paralyzed for eight years. Luke, the physician, makes note of this. And really, it's, uh, it's very important to realize that and to understand this eight years of suffering has been documented. Uh, the people in the community know this. Uh, they may even know about the sickness or the injury that created this uh, paralysis. This is not a trick. This is not someone that Peter sent ahead to pretend to be uh, sick, uh, someone that he could pretend to heal and, and get the publicity from uh, doing that. Uh, this is a real true medical need that Aeneas has. And when Peter sees him, he has compassion for this man. Uh, and he pronounces that Jesus has healed him. 
Uh, we do not see a lot of leading up to it, a lot of uh, understandings of what's going on, uh, conversation back and forth. Uh, Peter simply takes compassion on him and declares that Jesus has healed him. Um, he's very clear, uh, Peter is, that Jesus is the one who has done this. It's not him, it's not his power, and it is Jesus who is calling on the man to get up and make his bed. It's time for him to make his bed. He's losing his paralysis. No one else has to do it for him. Both of these actions, the getting up and the making of the bed, showed the totality of his healing. He's able suddenly to use his limbs to stand with balance, uh, with the strength of the muscles. You know how muscles uh, have atrophy as they are unused for a while. He is able to do this. He's able to balance and bend over and uh, pick up the bed and use his arms to fold it and to hold it and to uh, have it where he can move about with it. The healing is total because this is the power of Jesus at work. This is God's hand at work in him, but working through his followers. As we said, God invites his followers to be instruments of his power. Jesus' power was worked through Peter. And the word spread. It is so amazing that this has happened, that the word goes out to the people and they took note of it. I imagine if there was a telephone system, it would be buzzing with what had happened. And the Bible tells us that the people of Lydda and Sharon all knew about it. But the Sharon is uh, what we would know of as the Plain of Sharon. Lida was a community on the edge of the Plain of Sharon. So he's saying everybody in the city and in the surrounding countryside knew about what had happened. They heard about this. They saw the man standing, moving about, healed. This sign got their attention. And the Bible tells us that because of this, many turned to Jesus. You know, as I think about this word here, turned, uh, in the Greek, this could be translated as turned or returned. And really, in my mind, I, I think immediately about repentance. Repentance is a turning from the way you were headed to turn to walk with God, uh, to go the way God wants you to go, to go the way of God. And the people there turned to Jesus. The way they had been traveling was no longer the way they wanted to go. Having heard or seen themselves of what happened with the power of Jesus in the life of Aeneas, they made that commitment to him. Luke's story moves forward. There's more going on than just this. In fact, you come to a section where we see that it is important that they do not delay. Beginning reading in verse 36, uh, we read these words. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas. She was always doing good works and acts of charity. About that time, she became sick and died. After washing her, they placed her in a room upstairs. Since Lida was near Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there and sent two men to him who urged him, don't delay in coming with us. So here we see Joppa. Joppa is a seaport. It's nearby to where they are. And it's probably something that sticks in your mind from the story of Jonah. Joppa is where Jonah uh, boarded the ship uh, that took him away out into the ocean where uh, the storms came and he ended up in the belly of the great fish. Joppa was that. It was an important city. And as such, it did have a Christian community. Remember, the people that were there at Pentecost went home everywhere. Uh, they carried the message back with them that they had heard at Pentecost. So there's a strong Christian community there. One of the members of that Christian community, uh, Joppa was her home, is a lady by the name of Tabitha. Now in the Greek, that's Dorcas. Both Tabitha in the Hebrew and Dorcas in the Greek mean gazelle, is how we would translate it into English. And she was one who was ministering to the people. She's uh, referred to as a disciple 
named Tabitha. By the way, this is the only use of the feminine form of the word disciple in the New Testament. It uh, is a reminder to us that uh, Jesus calls all, male and female, uh, you, you know, doesn't matter. Uh, Acts chapter 2 talks about how the, the young men uh, will see, uh, you know, will, will prophesy, the, the young women will preach, or vice versa there. And the gospel message is carried by both. Tabitha carried this gospel message along with her ministry, and her ministry was doing good works and acts of charity, is the way that Luke describes it as here in the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, she was both faithful to her calling and good at her calling. Uh, and we get the impression as we look at this that she enjoyed ministering. It made her happy to be a minister. Uh, doing the things that she could do for others, the good works and the acts of charity. Something happened and she became sick, sick unto death. Uh, she actually died. And so the people began to prepare her body uh, to wash it and to get it ready uh, for the burial. And while they were doing this, uh, probably the ladies taking care of her, uh, the men began to think about the th what's going on and they Come, they are reminded that Peter's not far away. Uh, from Joppa uh, to Lydda is, is only about 12 miles. That's, you know, three hours walking uh, for them. It would not be a long trip. They were used to walking. And so in six hours, uh, the, a round trip could be made. Men could be sent, uh, talk to Peter, and return with Peter in a short six-hour period. And so they send for Peter uh, to come and to be with them. Now, why would they do this? What would be their rationale for inviting Peter? Apparently, he had never met Tabitha. Why would they want him there? Well, there are two lines of thought. One is, is having heard all the things that Peter was doing, uh, they may have kind of had the hope that he would resurrect Tabitha, uh, that he would let the power of God working through him bring her back to life. And so there was an unspoken hope uh, that came about from their inviting him. Others think perhaps it was simply because of who Peter is. He is an apostle, a renowned apostle, uh, one whose reputation is great, and, and it would be quite an honor for him to be there at the uh, burial of Tabitha, for him to attend her funeral service, uh, to honor her uh, in that way. The scriptures really don't say, and, and really when you get down to it, it really doesn't matter their motive for getting him there. Uh, it's important that they got him there. And we see this uh, played out. The men go, they talk to him, they encourage a quick return. Uh, they want him there. It, you know, some, uh, there's a lot of comparisons made between this and the, the raising of Lazarus uh, by Jesus and how Jesus delayed going. Uh, they wanted Peter to hurry back. Tabitha's already died. He, he, before Peter's even notified, she has died. And so it's more probably that they want him to get back before they actually bury her. Uh, they actually inter the body uh, that has been prepared. So here we are. Uh, Peter has been summoned and encouraged to hurry back. Uh, Tabitha is lying in state in an upstairs room with the ladies around her that uh, are sitting wake over her as they await the time of the interment. Peter comes, he goes into the room where the ladies are sitting with her, and he's gonna tell her to arise. We see in verse 39, Peter got up and went with him. When he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs, and all the Widows approached him, weeping and showing him the robes and clothes that Darkus had made while she was with him. Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, prayed, and turning toward the body, said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. He called the saints and widows and presented her alive. 
This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Peter stayed for some time in Joppa with Simon, a leather tanner. So here we see the story. Peter goes with the men. They return to Joppa, to the house where uh, the body of Tabitha is located. And he goes in. Uh, they, they invite him upstairs. I'm sure that during that trip back that they talked and Peter was told a lot about Tabitha and the things that she had done and given a good uh, report of her life and her work. The men who were going there or taking him back would know all about it. The, Peter is taken upstairs. The widows are well represented, the women that are there, but particularly the widows. They've come to honor Tabitha. And they brought with them robes and clothes, things that Tabitha has made for them. Uh, many of them, being widows, may not have been able to afford new clothing, but Tabitha uh, provides it for her. And so we see in, in her ministry of doing good works and acts of charity, as Luke says, that a lot of this was probably a, of the nature of being a seamstress. She was probably a very a sought after seamstress, one who um, knew well the art of making clothes. And so her most of her ministry, or a lot of her ministry, must have been with this. This is what they brought uh, to honor her with and to show. And to, I can imagine hearing them tell each other about, well, Tabitha made me this, and she brought it to me, and, and I've had it for two years now, and, and it hasn't worn out. And, and another one said, yeah, mine's five years old, and Tabitha's, you know, just done great. And I can hear this conversation going up. In fact, it's very clear, I think, that her memory would live long after her, if nothing else, in the lives of these widows, these women that she has helped. And think about that. Her ministry was very important. But it wasn't the preaching of, of great and mighty sermons. Uh, it wasn't in the working of miracles. None of those things are reported here. It was simply one lady helping others, and she had the means and the opportunity. It was a devoted disciple setting a great example for others as she ministered in that way. Peter hearing all this and feeling the leading of the Holy Spirit is, is led to pray for her restoration. However, this is not meant to be a show. It's not to be entertainment. And so he has a room cleared. It's, it's just him and the body of Tabitha as he kneels and praise in great humility going to God as he is leading for this to happen. You know, he deals, he prays, he speaks to Tabitha. It kind of reminds us also of what Jesus did with Jairus' daughter. You remember Jesus was called to the home of this official because his daughter was sick and the daughter died uh, before he got there. Jesus went up to the room and braced her to life with Peter and John there as his witnesses. There's, in both situations, the room is cleared of everybody else. Uh, it's just Jesus and his two disciples are here, just Peter. The room is cleared of everybody else. The dead is told to get up. Uh, they're just spoken to. Uh, that's, that's all that is needed. And the resurrection is the result. They both come back to life. In fact, as you look at these two passages of Scripture, you'll see that the words that are spoken are identical in the Aramaic except for one letter. In Jesus' uh, situation, he says, Talitha kum. Peter says, Tabitha kum. And so the only difference is in the uh, name of the individual where the L is replaced with a B and the words itself are basically the same in Aramaic. Just an interesting uh, coincidence perhaps, or perhaps Peter's memory reminded him of what Jesus Christ did and having the faith to believe that, Christ, that Jesus would do it through him. The Bible tells us that Tabitha opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up probably thinking that she ought to go get Peter something to eat. Uh, you know, the hostess in her coming out already, get him something to eat 
or to drink. Peter Doe helps her stand, and instead of sending her to the kitchen, he calls the others to come and see her. And they are assembled, they're, they're overwhelmed. Again, as uh, the word of Aeneas would spread, so the word of what happened to Lydia, uh, to Tabitha would spread here in this community. In fact, it says in the text that this became known throughout Joppa. And the result of this was an outpouring of belief as many new believers came to know the Lord, having heard about this. Luke completes this story by saying that Joppa was the home of a man by the name of Simon, who was a tanner. He worked with leather. Uh, that was his occupation. And he invited Peter to come and stay with him. Apparently he had extra room in his house, was a believer, and he invited Peter to go and to stay with him. Peter did. Peter was willing to go and stayed there uh, for uh, some period of time. There is a significance to this in that Simon the Tanner would be ritually unclean. Because he dealt with dead animals, uh, you know, preparing the skins uh, to make the leather, he would be excluded from any activities in the Jewish community. And whoever was with him would by default also be unclean. The fact that Peter would not even consider this and would go and stay with him, making himself ritually unclean, indicates that Peter was beginning to make that understanding move that Christ was for everybody. Uh, that the Old Testament uh, rules and regulations uh, were no longer uh, of that importance. Uh, particularly the ceremonial, the law ones. And so Peter ends this section here, Luke ends this section of Peter, uh, with an understanding that Peter is growing in his faith, uh, a growth that will continue uh, through uh, the weeks and months to come. So where do we stand with this today? What lessons do we take away from this today? Well, I believe that there are um, a few things that we can remember. First, let's go back to the, the key phrase for this uh, scripture lesson, for this Sunday school lesson. God invites his followers to be instruments of his power. God invites his followers, that's you and me, to be instruments of his power. Now, we may not be raising the dead. We may not be healing the sick, the paralyzed individuals but we can minister for him. God can work through us as we let him work through us. In fact, one of the things that I think we also need to learn here is that God can use, this is a lesson for us, God can use flawed people. Look at how he has used Peter. And yet Peter is the one who denied him. Uh, Peter is the one who uh, doubted him when he was walking on the water and saw the waves. We are all flawed, and yet God can use us. And so we need to make ourselves available for God to use. But I think the third lesson that we see here is that in all of these things, God deserves the credit. This isn't about you, it isn't about me. It's about God and what he's doing. And so we need to let God get the credit, for God deserves the credit. God works through us, even if we're flawed, but he gets the credit. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would help us to have the discernment to know what it is you would have us to do. Help us to understand what your ministry is for us so that we may, in true obedience, follow you and bring glory and honor to you. I pray, Father, for those who will be proclaiming your word. Fill them with your spirit. May your spirit touch those whose hearts are ready to be changed. And may many come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray for our world and our nation. For we know the only answer is you. And your son, Jesus Christ, for it's in his name we pray. Amen. Next week, uh, we're going to move on into Acts chapter 10. Uh, as we look at a story entitled, Including. And we'll continue looking at Peter 
in his life and ministry. I look forward to being with you as we continue looking at God's word.